So the Bristol Seed Swaps was started by a small group of friends about 20 years ago who just wanted to share seeds and have some fun. Since then, it's grown and evolved through the volunteers and donations that have supported it to become an annual event where hundreds of Bristolians come to share their seeds and meet other growers. Today, the goals of the Bristol Seed Swap are to make growing food cheaper and more accessible to all, to protect, to protect sorry, our traditional and heritage seeds, and to support our local community. We can't achieve these goals without your support, so if you are able to, please do consider making a donation to our PayPal account, which Claire will share in the chat now. Thank you, Claire. So usually the Bristol Seed Swap is a one day event in early February where anyone in Bristol is invited to bring seeds to swap or if they don't have seeds to swap, uh, pick up seeds for a small donation or if they can't afford the seeds, take the seeds anyway and hopefully bring that seeds, next seeds to the next swap. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Sarah Fenn. Sarah is a horticulturalist, founder of Incredible Edible Bristol, a writer, a blogger, a communicator and food activist. Today, Sarah is here to speak to us about the very important subjects of food justice and seed sovereignty in Bristol and beyond. So Sarah, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that you can share your slides and then it's over to you. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, hi everybody, I hope you're all doing okay. This is very strange because I can't see anybody, but I'm, I know you're all there. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about growing in the city and how vital it is as we kind of move into a, into a time of huge change, um, sort of post COVID and as we are stepping into um, trying to recover from three different crises, um, that of biodiversity, of the climate and of social justice. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Incredible Edible to begin with, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll crack on. So Incredible Edible began in 20, Incredible Edible Bristol began in 2014. Um, we jumped on the Incredible Edible sort of idea in that we love the idea of growing food in the city and um, in public spaces, but we were very much influenced by what was going on in the States, um, the urban sort of farming stuff um, and movement that was going on there. Um, and so whilst we seem to have been seen as kind of quite a safe, um, and gardening based organization. The reality is that we are deeply steeped in um, food justice. So um, we've been going since 2014. Um, we have up until this point supported around 50 ish gardens into, um, into Bristol. Um, most most of those are just in community spaces around the city, um, although obviously there are the big gardens that we look after as well in places like the Bear Pit and Millennium Square. Um, our real kind of core work is not to make gardens ourselves, but is to support people who want to make their own changes in their own spaces. So we support people through um, helping them with community consultation, um, through helping them with marketing, with volunteer, getting volunteers and maintaining volunteers. Um, and then there's this little bit at the end where we support them with horticulture. Um, but actually, you know, that's a tiny bit of what we do. Um, so that's us and we will give you all opportunities to ask questions at the end if I'm missing anything, which I'm sure I am. Um, so why grow in the city? It's a good question that is regularly thrown at us. What is, what is the point? Why would you do that? Food comes from the countryside. There's plenty of farmland. We don't, we don't need to be growing food in the, in the city. Um, but what people forget is that food is an important part of what comes from nature. Um, and that, that connection with nature is vital. And I think we've all realised that far more over the last year. And I think it's become something that people are really kind of understanding. Um, so it's not just about growing food, although it is very much about growing food, but it's also about bringing people together to connect with the nature that is in the city. Um, we're not talking about going on walks up hills with, you know, we're talking about being aware of what we have in the city, um, how to make that biodiversity more abundant, 
whilst also ensuring that we are growing food for uh, for and to support local communities. Um, but it's also a part of something which is really important, and that's a local food economy. Um, we, at the moment, have a food system that supports large corporations to move food across the country and across the world in ways that just are no longer sustainable. Um, so, uh, you know, a local food economy doesn't just create spaces for community gardens, but it also creates spaces for people to actually make um, sustainable businesses um, and creates livelihoods. Now, and, and that's the important word, you're never going to be rich growing food in the city but you will maintain a livelihood and you will support your community. Um, and I think that the one of the things that's become really apparent um, over the last months is that um, we are all very focused on creating wealth and actually we need to be more, far more focused on just creating enough. Um, and this is Purple Patch, which if you don't know where it is, that's um, a market garden that's I think on two or three acres in um, St. Werberg's, just behind St. Werberg's City Farm. Um, it has a community supported agriculture system. It grows food for the cafe at St. Werberg's City Farm. Um, and it's a wonderful, beautiful space in the center of the city. Um, so yeah, that's um, where that is. So what does urban food production look like? Um, so, so these are the things that we assume that it will look like. We assume it will look like allotments, community gardens and market gardens, but actually it can be far more than that. Um, it can look like a difference in the way that we landscape our city. Um, it can look like how we use just little patches within our cities to create small patches of food growing, which all together actually create a considerable amount of acreage. Um, it can also look at how we use land that's owned by people um, that they don't use. So, you, you know, over and over again, I get people coming to me and asking how we can set up a garden share. Um, over and over again, people have set up garden shares that haven't worked. And so I'm quite determined this year to work out why they don't work and see if we can get to the bottom of how we can get people using land that other people don't feel that they are able to. But is it really important, important and why? So in the 80s, um, it became absolutely apparent when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, um, that actually, if you get the global food system shut down to you, your people are very hungry very fast. And that's what happened in Cuba. Um, and suddenly there were community, there were, there were far, tiny farms, urban, urban growing was going on all over the city. And the reason it was going on all over the city was because it was a need. It wasn't some jolly middle class kind of, oh, this, this would be nice. It was actually people who were hungry. Um, and that has then moved around the globe. And you, you know, we saw it probably most recently in Detroit, um, where the car industry collapsed. Um, there were 2 million people in Detroit to start with. There are now, I think, about 500,000. Um, and again, you know, people were hungry and that was leading people to sort of, you know, shoot each other and, and, and not be very nice. Not be very nice, God, how nice can I sound? Um, and, and that then that then turned into a, a huge movement of, of community farms and community gardens across the city. So there are now 1400 community gardens across um, across Detroit and um, and they grow 600,000 tons of food a year, which is a lot of food. Um, but more importantly, it creates livelihoods, it, it shares skills, it makes opportunity. So again, Detroit is probably never gonna get back to the wealth creator that it was, but it has a, a functioning way of creating livelihoods. Um, and this is in the center of Detroit. So I will show that to you again with a quite glaring um, part of Bristol and yes let's see what everybody thinks. Um, so they've um, coined the term agrihood 
Um, and, and that's just basically, you know, the idea is that it's not just about people farming, it's about people recognising that they have these tools, whereas the people over here have these tools. It's about a sharing economy um, and creating, you know, really important things like packing houses and, and education so that more people can come on board. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about Seattle. So a few years ago, a friend of mine went to Seattle um, and she rang me from Seattle and said, we all need to move to Seattle. And I went, no, 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 we need to create Seattle elsewhere. Um, so Seattle has an amazing, amazing community um, growing kind of ethos, I guess. There are loads and loads and loads of, of um, projects, but there are two things that really stuck with me. Um, so first of all, pea patches, which are effectively allotments, but they have a, they have social equity. So if you have a pea patch, effectively half of your allotment is for your own food growing, and then the other half is for growing for food banks and um, soup kitchens and charity, basically. Um, and I am regularly asked how we can do this, and I'm going to be really honest: just do it. You need to just form committees or not even committees that's you know form groups on allotment sites and just get sharing contact your local food bank um if they they can't help you then an organization like feeding bristol or fair share will help you um but this is a really important part of how we can make sure that people in the city are fed and they're not relying on the food aid system which at the moment relies on big supermarkets um so that's that's Seattle. The other thing that is amazing about Seattle um, is that they have a horticulture hotline. Now, I absolutely love that idea, but what I love about it more than anything is the fact that it's resourced by their city council. So they recognise the need for urban food growing to be a thing and the city supports it by employing a horticulturalist who is available to you Monday to Friday nine to five and who will do lots and lots and lots of courses and talks and and cope with problems that are arising so that people can actually not fail because they just don't have good knowledge um, so yeah so I think Seattle is a great place to look at um, there's a there's tons and tons and tons of information about all this stuff on online um lots and lots of cities across america are doing similar things um and and are far 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 ahead of what our movement looks like in the uk um mainly because rather than being led by the nice people that lead it here it tends far more to be led by indigenous people, by people of color. Um, so how does this equate to Bristol and the wider UK? So we are stepping into a post COVID world. Um, and in Bristol, we do have a thriving food movement. Um, and we've seen how over the last year, oh, no, you don't wanna go there yet, Sarah. Um, we've seen, how over the over the last year you know that th people have come together and they have created a way to make sure that food in the city has been accessible to those who might be struggling but we're also completely aware that moving into 2021 things don't appear to be getting that much better people are losing their jobs right left and center um, there are whole sectors of the economy which are about to or likely to or certainly in a position where they could topple um and we also know that we're a city with food deserts and with pockets of deep deep poverty um and and that is increasing um so one of the things i wanted to talk to talk about is the concept of a food desert so the food desert or the food swamp has always been a slightly people have been very you know uncomfortable talking about that those things but the reality is that they are far more common in, in this city than anybody really wants to acknowledge. Um, there is a lady in New York State called Karen Washington who has recently been doing a lot of work around um, food deserts and food poverty. Um, and she has come up with, and I don't apologize for this phrase, but it is quite harsh. She has come up with the term food apartheid. 
Now, that is a difficult word to use, but the reason that she's come up with that is because a desert is a natural, natural occurrence. A swamp is a natural occurrence. Apartheid is designed. And these food deserts, this food apartheid is designed into our cities. So we've seen over the last 30 years, high streets shutting down, the supermarkets being allowed to take over. Um, and there are a fair few places where if you live in, the, in our city and you don't have access to a car, then you do not have access to food. Um, and, and that's a really sad thing to say, but it's true. Um, I lived in um, an area of Northwest called Inns Court um, a few years ago, and literally the only food offer I had without getting into a car was McDonald's, um, a chicken place, or the garage around the corner. So, and added to that, our public transport is no longer it's no longer created for us to be able to move ourselves and our shopping around. So in years gone by, there was always a big space at the front of a bus where you could put your shopping and you could probably have done a week's shopping, but if you relied on the bus. That now is there for the free newspaper. And there isn't that availability. You can't get more than three bags of shopping on a bus. So if you've got three kids, you're relying on public transport, you have to travel everywhere with them. Unfortunately, you can only probably buy one or two days shopping at a time. Um, economically, that's a disaster for people. Um, and, you know, we need to work on these things and we need to work on them well. And we need to acknowledge that these places are, you know, places of poverty are places where there are not jobs. We need to create jobs in those areas. Um, so that once we, um, so that these areas become areas creating and supporting their own livelihoods. Um, and, one, and, and we just need a greener and health, healthier city and one that doesn't have to rely on huge distribution chains to feed us. Um, this is the Skip Garden in London. This um, is an amazing garden in King's Cross where they literally grow food in skips. Um, and I'm really embarrassed to say I can't actually remember where that one is. Anyway, it looks very lovely. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what food justice actually means, um, and then talk a little bit about food insecurity and what, how that term came about. So the food justice movement is a grassroots initiative emerging from communities in response to food insecurity and economic pressures that prevent access to healthy, nutritious and culturally appropriate foods. Food justice is closely connected to food sovereignty, which critiques structural barriers communities face to accessing local and healthy food. It is argued that lack of access to good food is both a cause and a symptom of the structural inequalities that divide society. A possible solution presented for poor areas includes community food gardens, food, fairness for food workers and a national food policy. Um, now, I have then got here, definition of food security as defined by the UN, which is at all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their food preferences and dietary needs for an active, healthy life. Now, they kind of sound quite similar, but, and here's the important thing, um, the food justice movement comes from a grassroots response, whereas the food security definition was defined by the UN. And when you go into the, the food security um, stuff and you read the UN website about it, which you might like to do, it is all quite interesting. Um, what the, the UN are focused on is tech-based solutions. So how to ensure that people have enough chemicals in order to grow enough food, enough fertilizer in order to grow enough food, um, greenhouses, irrigation systems, um, but it also supports the, the year-round exportation of foodstuffs around the globe, um, which we know, having been back in March in a position where everybody was buying everything just in case, um, 
actually almost brought the distribution system to a grinding halt. Um, and we know that it almost brought the, the system to a grinding halt because all of a sudden um, there was no th there was no surplus. The surplus just disappeared, um, and and that was the big issue for a lot of the um, the food aid organisations. Um, whereas food justice comes from grassroots, um, it comes from local organising, um, and across the globe, the food justice movement feeds 70% of our population. Um, it's, the, it's the food insecurity systems that actually create huge amounts of waste um, and, and just basically stop everybody being fed. The world creates enough food, we just don't create it necessarily in the right places. So what does food justice look like and how do we ensure food sovereignty? So, I mean, there are a million and one ways of securing food sovereignty and there are a million and one reasons why we, why we should. Um, and it all starts with seed sovereignty. It's utterly ridiculous um, that we rely on China and um, the Far East and South America to grow the majority of our, of our seed. Um, and I think it's really, really, really important that no matter how many people think that, oh, well, I've bought a lovely looking seed packet, it must have been grown nicely. It, if it hasn't come from a seed grower that you know is a seed grower, then there's every chance it's just globally produced seed that effectively is owned by one of three big pharmaceutical companies. So local food um, sovereignty relies on local seed sovereignty um, because what grows well in one part of the UK won't grow well in another um, and, and that is something that needs um, constant work on and that we really as a city we could make real change by creating a seed bank um, for, for food and for seed sovereignty. Um, But there are a whole load of ways that we need to, things that we need to look at and changes that we need to look at um, in order to get, the, get to the point where everybody can, can play into this conversation and it becomes a truly community-led project. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just going to start with allotment provision because um, there's a whole load of stuff around allotment provision and I'm basing this mainly on Bristol and I'm aware of the fact that there are people from all across the country here, um, but I'm constantly told that there are no allotments to be had in Bristol um, and it, it's just not true. Um, there are lots of allotments to be had, but there may not be allotments on the sites that you think you want to have an allotment on. Um, but my advice to anybody who comes to me and says, oh, I want an allotment in Bristol, how do I go about it? The reality is you can fill in a form on the website and wait, or you can be proactive. And by proactive, I mean, go and find the allotment site that you think you want to be on, um, see what their waiting list is like, go talk to their rep, um, fill in the form on the website, and then ring the allotment office every, every week, once a week. And eventually they will go, this person is serious, we'll give them an allotment. Um, it may not be on the site that you want. There are definitely very popular sites in the city and there are definitely pop sites that are not so popular in the city. Um, but if you're prepared to travel 15, 20 minutes, then um, I pretty much think that most people can access an allotment. Um, however, I also think it's really important that people understand that if you live in a place where there are no allotments and, um, and there are more than six of you, that by law, your local authority has to say, we will look for more um, allotment land if there are people who want it. That's the law, it cannot be changed unless it goes to a big whatever a parliament, which it won't do. Um, they will say to you, oh, we'll do a consultation, we'll do this, we'll blah, blah, blah just hold them to account. Um, we need allotment land. Post-World War I, we acknowledged 
that we needed allotment land because whereas nobody knew what PTSD was at the time, they acknowledged that being on the land was really important for people's recovery post-war. Um, and we are entering a time of mass trauma um, and they need to acknowledge that. And this is one of the ways that they can do it. Unfortunately, what they tend to do is look to large organiser, large volunteering organisations, I think, um, and, and, you know, what they want to funnel everybody into places that they can fund. And actually, that's not really the answer. People need to find headspace and um, allotments are the ideal way of doing that. Um, but also community gardens, local community gardens really need to be something that that local authorities look at putting land aside for. Don't try and create themselves. Don't cry, try and put, you know, a big organisation in charge of them, but actually just let people know that there are, this is, this is where the land is that we think community gardens could be put onto because, you, you know, community gardens are very often a start for people who then go on to be, be urban farmers. Um, so, you know, whether it's city centre beds, parks, whatever, you know, these places are all good for food growing. Um, so there are a whole sort of load of things that we need in order to um, create a, a, a space where more food growing can happen. One of them, obviously, is access to land. And access to land doesn't just mean, oh, there's a bit of, there's some spare there's some spare land over there it means actually looking at land and looking at acreage and looking at how much land you would need to feed a city and the reality is even if we here used all the spare land we think we have in Bristol we think that we would probably be able to create around 15 to 20 percent of the fruit and veg that we need which isn't a lot um, but add to that the kind of peri-urban areas and and the the wider sort of food shed larder that we have around us and and there's probably there's scope for a lot more than that um but we also need access to skills and we need equitable access to skills so horticulture obviously an expensive thing to study um the rhs calls its cost an absolute fortune and are in some places re places really good and in some places really not so good um you can go and obviously do city and guilds but i used to train for city and guilds and city and guilds level one you have to be able to prove that you can put a bin bag into a bin which i don't really think is an ideal um way to teach people horticulture yes jess really um so so what do i mean by equitable skills and skill sharing i think what i mean is there are always in every community there are people who are passionate about food there are people who are passionate about food growing there are people who are passionate about cooking um and and who have years of experience but may not be the people who want to actually sort of lead on a project so it's really important that we find those community food champions and we allow them to teach that and, and share their knowledge um, so that's that's one way um, there's also um, you know affordable education um, which I think, you know, again, if we go back to the Seattle model, needs to be resourced. Um, and if it can't be resourced by a city, then it needs to be resourced by the education system. Um, but I think what we also need to acknowledge is we need to acknowledge that food growing in terms of a career point of view is not acknowledged in schools. And this is something that I've been banging on about for years and years and years. Um, but we need we need to get into schools, not necessarily to teach horticulture, but we need to get into schools so that we can say to schools, these are the options for people. And the reason we need to do that is because a few years ago, we were doing some work in Hartcliffe. And we had this particularly lovely lad. I say that he had his moments, but anyway. Um, and the first thing that he said to me when I first met him was that he was, um, he wasn't he I'm not very bright Sarah I'm you, you know I'm not academic and he was nine and I was like right okay well that doesn't matter so he came along and he came along week after week after week and he was really engaged and he really got it and you could really see that he got loads out of being on the land um but he told us that he was going to be in the army because that was the only thing that he was any good for teacher's words 
not mine. Um, and I said, oh, well, is that what you want to do? And he, he was like, no, not really, but you know, what else can I do? So anyway, it went on and I'm, you know, never gonna say to him, well, you, you, you. but it went on. And then suddenly one week he looked at me and he went, is this a job? And I'm like, well, what do you think farming is? And suddenly he realized that actually what he'd considered as being a hobby was actually something that he could do to create a living. Um, and if that's being missed in nine-year-olds, then that's just heartbreaking. Because once you say to a, a, a youngish lad, and you might be able to drive a tractor, they're, they're all on board. Um, so yeah, so we really, 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 as a city, need to work on that. Um, so I'm going to go just go back to, I'm aware this has all been a bit, you know, serious. I'm just going to go back to this beautiful place in Detroit, which is somewhere that I want to just sit and breathe and just, uh, you know, or do we want this city centre? It seems utterly ridiculous to me that when we could have something that's beautiful, we just have something that's corporate and bare and horribly clean and sterile um, and I'm also very aware of the fact that it's never that clean and sterile um, it's always covered in all sorts of nastiness so you know I just think there's no comparison really um, and this should be something that we're working towards so what what could it look like so there are a whole load of things it could look like um, it can look like community orchards, which are just places where we don't just grow fruit, but we grow community. We wassail, we do all the traditional things that for hundreds of years we've done in this country and we have just forgotten about. Um, you know, the, the amount of cultural festivities that happen in orchards are extraordinary, but they also give us opportunities to do things like have goats and pigs and whatever your whatever your diet they they give opportunity to create also protein in the city um because if you had a an orchard that looks like this when it first starts put pigs in there and they'll be it'll be cleared in you know next to no time um and and both of these places have had street goat visit to um eat the brambles so you, you know there is definitely a, a wider conversation um it's also great to bring children into to talk about orchards and talk about where our food comes from and get learn the skills of tree planting which so many people just think oh just dig a hole and put it in if only it was that simple um so community orchards is one way community gardens um are amazing spaces that again they grow food but they also grow community they grow food but they also work for people's health and well-being um and they're joyous places um and particularly you, you know they they don't have to be hidden away they can be out in the public realm um and it's perfectly fine and it's perfectly safe and people leave it alone or just help themselves to the food as they need to um but also this is a community garden that's in Avonmouth on the train station, um, creating food for, a, for an area that struggles in a really big way to get access to any fresh or affordable food. Um, so it's really, you, you know, community gardens are absolutely one of the ways forwards. And also community gardens can create roles, they can create jobs, they can create livelihoods, they can support people, um, to you know you know you can have somebody in there on a, a daily basis whose job is to teach the community and support the community to make more gardens and and th you know move this around an area um edible landscaping people often wonder what that means um but actually when we plant a tree how how hard do we think about what type of tree we plant and what are the myths that stop us from um, growing fruit in the city, for example? You know, a million and one times I hear, oh, but, you know, if we put an apple tree in there, um, a, a child will, will lob the apple at somebody. Um, and actually, they might very well do that, but they might also pick an apple and just eat it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we have to we have to fight that mythology about what could happen and actually look at the positives and why 
possibly it should happen. One of my biggest bugbears in the city is the area around the cenotaph, um, which was planted up a few years ago in the most horrific way. Still looks absolutely appalling to this day that it, none of the planting makes any sense whatsoever. Whereas actually in a city that struggles with homelessness, it would have been really great to see fresh food put in there. Um, and I think you could almost argue that it's wrong not to. Um, and then market gardens. Market gardens are a big part of how we can create a food equitable city. Um, you, you know, looking at community supported agriculture projects, but also looking at um, those big pieces of, of land that really aren't, aren't used for anything much other than people walking through on their way somewhere else. Um, could absolutely be used for creating um, a good amount of food um, that, that could sell into the city. Um, the problem that we have is often people start market gardens without thinking about where their market is. Um, and the whole point about market gardens is that they are market gardens. Um, so you have to do a bit of work around how you're going to sell and how that's going to work and, and it, you know, working with people on how that's going to work for them. Um, but absolutely, there are thriving market gardens all across the city that, you know, have either fed into our restaurants in the past or are now feeding into the food aid um, system. And there is, without a doubt, room for and loads and loads more. Um, and that is that is me. Um, these are where you can find us and me at. Um, we are all over social media. And um, yeah, so shall we move on to questions? Okay, it's not many, it's only a, it's only a couple. <laughs> Let me get my questions up, bear with me. So I've had one question. Does Ed, uh, inc Incredible Edibles support community, community gardens in Greater Bristol, e.g. South Gloucestershire? Or is it just in the Bristol postcodes? If it has a BS postcode, we support it. Okay. Next question. Um, someone said they've had an allotment, but they want to raise eggs and meat. Any tips? Um, so you can have chickens on an allotment. That's not an issue. Um, I don't, I don't even think, so I don't even think that you need permission for chickens or bees. I think you might have to check that. I might have just made that up, but I'm pretty sure somewhere I know, I've heard that, that and there are loads of, um, there are loads of chickens all across, and bees actually, all across the, the city on allotment sites. Whether or not they have permission to be there, I don't know, but I am very much of the, of the thought that if you just get on with stuff, generally people don't mind. Um, in terms of pigs, Pigs take up quite a lot of space. There is a lot of space available in the city, but I think what you have to think about with anything that's any bigger than a chicken is have you got enough space to feed it? Um, and what I would always suggest people do is go and look at the street goat model. So if you don't know about street goat, they are some goats that live in St George um, and that go out and do sort of restoration grazing and um, chopping down of things like brambles um, all across the city. The model is really, really interesting. I would, I would suggest going and looking that up. I wouldn't suggest that just having a pig on your allotment is really feasible, sadly. Um, is there an issue with traffic pollution of the food in the city centre growing spaces? Okay, so I get asked this. Uh, it, this would not be a talk if I didn't get asked this question. Um, <laughs> I, there isn't. The most important thing with any food is that you wash it. Um, and I would say that that is, that goes absolutely for um, any food, whether you've bought it from a, a supermarket or you've picked it off a tree from the middle of the bear pit, wash it because it will have, any, any food will have some sort of pollution on it. Um, Nothing will do it, do you do it any harm, but from the bear pit, you might have just like a bit of dust on it. From a supermarket, you've probably got a cocktail of 14 different chemicals. So just wash it, but also be aware that the food that you buy from a supermarket is not clean. 
Perfect. Um, are community spaces tested for contaminated land first before used for food produ food production? Sorry. Always. And actually, that is something that the, that the council will do for you. You just have to get in touch with the allotments team and they will come along and take some soil samples and let you know. <laughs> Basically, just let you know. No, no problem. That. <laughs> um, having said that, in 50 plus gardens, we have never had anything come back. Amazing. Um, I'm sorry, just this question is coming in or something. Is there, is there a community garden um, near Innscourt, Bristol? Um, there isn't at the moment, but we're working with an organisation to look at how we can support the community to create one. I'm just scanning through the last of the questions because some come in threes. Um, um, one says, do you need, do we need government secure subsidy, healthy food outlets in food deserts? Um, I would say we need nothing from the government in food deserts. They've done their harm. Um, I think we need community-led mm -hmm. shops, gardens, farms, whatever. But I, 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 yeah, the, the government are not interested in this stuff. So I just think we bypass them. Yeah. How is Incredible Edible funded? Um, effectively, we're really not. Um, we get project funding for specific um, spaces, but we're all volunteers. I'm just going to scan through these last few questions, but I think. Okay, while, you, while you're reading those, uh, Sarah, I've got a question. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I didn't take a screenshot of the last slide with um, all the web addresses on them. So where can we go? Where can we search to find out more about food justice and seed sovereignty in, in Bristol? So if you want to look about food justice, there are a whole load of organisations that I would suggest you go and look at. So first of all, there's the Land Workers Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, there's the Gaia Foundation who are doing a huge amount of work on seed sovereignty. Um, there are places like UK Sustain and the Sustainable Food Trust. Um, but equally, I would say if you look at food justice stuff in the States, there is a whole lot more there. Um, which kind of explains where and how it's kind of emerged. So Soulfire Farm is one place that does a lot of work on food justice. Um, there's another guy, um, Sylvan Aqua Farms, who is creating a, a food economy um, and doing amazing work. Um, but also people like Karen Washington and um, Ron Finley, who are all doing huge amounts of work to create food growing in, in small urban spaces. Thank you. And if you want us, we're at ediblebristol.org.uk. Thank you. Right, a couple more questions. Um, organic, organic standards, is this something to aim for or can it be a limiting factor for community growing? So my personal feeling is that organic standards are no longer good enough. Um, organic standards still allow you to spray all sorts of unpleasant pesticides. Um, so I would say that we need to be looking at agroecological systems um, where we're actually working with nature um, to support us to have food, but also supporting the nature that's in our cities to thrive and increase. Um, so yeah, I would say organic is it's gone. Also, I think it's really important to say that there's, there's there's the perfect organic kind of thing, and then there's something that there's a system that works. For example, lots of Spanish tomatoes that are growing in huge greenhouses in no soil, but are organic because they don't use any chemically made pest you know synthetically made pesticides that you know I, I think I think those days of, of just going oh that's organic it's fine are gone so yeah I think we need we need an agroecological standard um is Gruella gardening we were rewilding helpful and what is the role of foraging and planting forageable foods so I uh, I love the concept of guerrilla gardening but the reality of guerrilla gardening is that it's gardening and then leaving it to get on with itself and it doesn't work and it's a waste of resources often um, you know you can chuck seeds around 
um, but that goes back to the whole notion of just treating seeds as something that you just literally chuck around, they're just a commodity. Um, so in my mind, you have to make sure that things work because otherwise it's just a, um, a bit of a waste. Um, rewilding is, the concept of rewilding again is brilliant, but it relies on um, land ownership. Um, and I don't think that that's the right way around. It should be relying on us releasing the commons back into the hands of people. Okay. Um, someone, would, someone would like to start a local community compost and shredding pump, um, project. Are there already any in place in Bristol? So community composting is very difficult um, because the the laws around composting are huge and rightly so um, and the reason I say rightly so is that every single compost company that any that we bought from last year was having massive problems with green waste that was um, badly affected by chemicals so lots of people failed um, and Jess will tell everybody that we had an absolute disaster in one of the incredible edible plots because we accidentally bought in soil that was completely contaminated with something called amino pyrolid, um, which will just kill your plants um, and stop things growing. So um, there's also issues around sort of leaching of nutrients onto urban land and into our waterways and things. So there is a community composting or there was a community composting site in Thornbury. I don't know if it's still there, um, yes, it is. but that's the only one I know in the whole country. Um, so yeah, I, I would say go and go and look at the rules and the regs, and if that doesn't put you off, then just go do it. But yeah, it's huge, and you do need to be aware of that. Perfect. Um, do you have any advice on how to get a growing space going on unused land? Um, who who would you need to contact for permission? So. I would say that the first thing you need to do before you do anything else is you need to make sure that you've got a whole load of people on board from the community. Um, we often get asked that, that question and it can often be one person or a couple or, you know, and you need, you need to have community buy-in. And the reason you need to have community buy-in is not because it's the right thing to do, but it's because it's that huge community buy-in that stops anybody vandalizing the space. Um, so it's the usual story is that, you know, oh, community gardens always get vandalized. And, and it, if the community hasn't been consulted properly, then that's absolutely what happens. Um, and it can be really, really, really disappointing. Um, so I would say before you do anything else, get a group together, um, and, and you, you know, work out what exactly it is you want to do. Um, and then you can either go to the, to the, to the city council, um, you can come to us, we can help that whole process. Um, but yeah, before, before you do anything, I would say you need a group of between 10 and 12 people. Perfect. Um, where is a good starting point for agroecological growing, please? Um, so I would, I, in terms of information, there's loads of information online. Just, just Google agroecological growing, and you'll have a ton of stuff. Um, the reality of agroecological growing is that it is just growing with nature. Um, so the, the first thing you have to do is just acknowledge that a, you've, you've not got to use anything that comes out of a spray, and b, you've just got to see anything that comes in to your garden or to the space as being a positive rather than a negative. So even if it's a pest, even if it's an aphid, that aphid is a good thing because it will bring in the ladybirds. Perfect, I think. That's about it, hold on a minute. Yeah, that's it. No more questions from my side. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That's, I mean, food justice and sea quality is clearly a very deep and wide issue. And I know I'll definitely be following some of those links that you told us about. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um,